Welcome to the Abundant Accountant Podcast. This is where accounting professionals just like you learn all the ways to grow their firm, sharpen their skills, and have consistent increasing sales. I cover topics such as detaching from the emotional side of the sale, having paradigm shifts in the most important part of your business, which is the nucleus of your accounting firm, sales, and how to see an objection really as an asset and stop giving away your time for free for those that don't deserve it. So you can actually get paid your value and your worth and grow your top line revenue. You'll learn tips, sales strategies, as well as hear from personal interviews from successful accounting professionals. This podcast will show you exactly the blueprint on how to create the firm and life of your dreams full of abundance. Welcome back to the Abundant Accountant Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. Our special guest is Dominique Molina, who is a CPA, MST, and CTS, and is the co-founder and president of the American Institute of Certified Tax Planners. She is the driving force and visionary behind this San Diego nonprofit that helps tax professionals approach tax planning, realizing that many tax professionals were missing government tax breaks that could save their clients millions of dollars. So she has created an elite network of tax pros, CPAs, EAs, and tax attorneys who are trained to help their clients proactively implement tax strategies and rescue their clients out of thousands of dollars in wasted tax. She has successfully licensed over a thousand tax pros as certified tax planners across the country. She is also an accomplished keynote speaker, teacher, six-time best-selling author, and mentor to tax professionals across the U.S. She routinely speaks for Surgeon CPE, and AICPA Women's Leadership Summit, among with other leading professional groups. But before we welcome Dominique to the show, I know that as a tax and accounting professional, I imagine you are sick of grinding 14 hours a day, sacrificing your time with family and friends, and postponing vacations that are way long overdue, and are completely exhausted from being on the financial roller coaster from discounting your fees, and then end up resenting the work that you do for them and feeling like a commodity. But, you know, none of this is your fault. I know that nobody is training you on how to fix these problems and connect the dots. So my team and I have set aside some time in the next 48 hours to speak to you personally about how you can apply some new strategies to your firm today to put all of that to rest. So head on over to theabundantcall.com to book your call with us. Whatever your biggest challenges are, we've seen it and we know how to overcome it. So head on over to theabundantcall.com. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes. We'll get crystal clear on where you're at right now with your firm, what's keeping you stuck. We'll also identify where you want to be with your firm and in your life so you can get paid first, never discount, and avoid all those pitfalls along the way and save you a ton of money in the process. So head on over to theabundantcall.com, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Now let's welcome Dominique to the show. Welcome, Dominique, to the show. Thanks for having me, Michelle. Thank you so much for being back with us here on the Abundant Accountant Podcast. And today we are talking about, you know, your your tips and tricks on how to buy tax tax practices for pennies on the dollar and hopefully turn some of those clients into high paying clients. Cause I know that's a big challenge I've heard from a lot of firm owners who want to start their firms. You know, they might be in corporate with a side hustle, but they need clients. So they're like, Oh, let me buy up this tax practice. And then they're like, Oh my gosh, I have 700 clients that only want to pay me a hundred dollars each. Um, so would love to dive in with you on that. But before we start, for those of you that might not be familiar with who you are, do you want to share real quick, who you are, even though I just did your bio, I think it's always better to come from you as the guest. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thanks again for having me back, Michelle. I love being able to connect with my fellow tax professionals. Uh, We are a unique breed of individuals, as you know. And so anytime I get to uh, connect, even if it's uh, in this type of environment, uh, it's exciting for me. 
because uh, it doesn't happen that often. I don't often walk into a cocktail party and find somebody else there that's like me. <laughs> <laughs> If you can relate uh, out there, but um, I've been in the tax business really since about 15 years old when I did my very first tax return for myself and I wanted to know what in the heck, why, why was I not keeping everything that I was making? Um, and I just loved the puzzle of it all. I loved the problem solving and uh, made it a career choice for myself. And so I've been helping small business owners for over 30 years um, and with an emphasis specifically in advanced tax reduction, I've got a graduate degree from law school in that topic. And so my specialty is helping people uh, pay a lot less in tax legally. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Really, that is that secret to getting firms for pennies on the dollar is being able to come in and inc immediately increase the value of those clients. And I found that that tax reduction is really a great way to do that. Love it. Okay. So tax reduction is your forte and how to do it legally. But I know we're talking today about how to buy tax practices for pennies on the dollar. So other firm owners can start a practice. Maybe, you know, they don't have any clients. They don't want to dive into marketing and they rather just buy something up. So what would be that first step for them? And, you know, give us give us all the goods, all your tips and tricks, especially on how to do it for not that much money. And then we'll get into what you do with the clients and how do you convert them into higher paying clients. So, you know, you can help them save taxes legally and do tax reduction and do more of that high value service stuff that we've talked about on previous episodes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, buying a business is one of the fastest ways to build wealth and grow your business. And, um, you know, not only, um, in any kind of industry, but when we specifically look at service-based industries, you analyze what are you actually buying and you're buying a revenue stream when you purchase a tax practice. And so it's a great way to get started. It's a great way to enhance the valuation of your firm. So let's say that you're approaching uh, your exit strategy or you're building your exit strategy and you're just not quite where you want your valuation to be, buying an existing tax practice is a really fast way to add that value to your practice. And so, Michelle, um, I love a good deal. And I know you like a good I deal do. as well. <laughs> I do. So that's what this is all about. It's about turning this into a really good deal. Now, typically, tax practices are valued based on the top line revenue, right? Okay. So we look at what is that income that's coming into the practice, and then there's some sort of multiple. There's a multiplier, and it's anywhere from 0.8% percent of one year's revenues all the way up to about 1.3 is what we see. But let me tell you, COVID-19 has started a recession in the U.S. and that is the best time to acquire companies because prices drop, multiples drop, and what happens is buyers tend to disappear and nervous sellers scramble to sell. So it's a really opportune time to not only see if we can get that multiple to drop so that the price of getting the business is cheaper, but it's also about how can you maybe even work a deal for yourself where there's no money down? You have no cash out of pocket coming into it. And because of the challenges we've seen in the last two years in particular, this is the ideal time. When we look throughout history, multiples tend to be lower when we have recessions start and they start to increase steadily thereafter. So we're in the middle of a time where it's an important positioning time uh, in, in um, picking up practices like this. Now, the other point that I wanna make is, let's say you even get it for a really low multiple, we still have to consider cash out of pocket and how much uh, to, to negotiate that and what happens if you don't have the cash. So we'll talk about that today. But the other factor is 
how you can make it an even better deal over time by increasing the value of those clients. So let's say that you're able to come in and now charge three times what the previous accountant charged, Michelle. Now all of a sudden my multiplier just plunged because I've enhanced that first year revenue to a much bigger number, which means relatively speaking, I've gotten that purchase price for a really good discount. Yeah. And so this is my favorite way to do this. It's, it's really a hundreds of billions of dollars opportunity because there's lots of people when we look at the size of firms um, among sole practitioners and smaller firms, over 70% are over the age of 50. Wow. That's an important factor as well, because the last two years have been rough. It's been really rough. And there's a lot of accountants that are just leaving that are like, mm -hmm. I'm out. I can't deal with this anymore. So if you're curious about this, there's a really great article that's in CPA Practice Advisor magazine, and it's uh, it's called the state of the accounting firm succession. And it talks about, you know, CPAs that are retiring in the next decade and what kinds of practices are available. Um, as a result of these conditions, sellers will likely receive a lot less than expected. But here's the thing. When you're the buyer, that's a good thing. We want everything to be on sale. Yes, we do. Well, in some, in some instances, not always. But I would say with buying a tax practice for pennies on the dollar, getting it at a discount or a sale price is in your best interest, especially if the firm owner is over 50 and wants out, then you're, then, you know, you are in a, in a power position. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear, you know, what do you think the three different scenarios are for an acquisition of a tax, tax practice based on the different variations on ways that they can make an offer if someone, you know, is listening and maybe they don't want to spend the marketing dollars to grow from scratch, but will contact one of these firm owners that are on their way out or nearing, you know, burnout and making these shifts. What, what kind of deal structures have you seen um, that have been really, really good and for a great oh, deal? I, I've, seen, I've seen accountants come in and get practices for 10 cents on the dollar. Wow. Um, and so you're looking for certain circumstances uh, and there's lots of benefits to why the, the issue of why buy versus startup. There's less risk. You've got better financing options. You have instant customers, instant profits, instant sales, instant systems and employees in some case, you, cases, you know, depending on the type of business that you find. Um, but let me tell you that the best deals will not be found through a business broker. And so in this uh, market that I'm describing, you have to become what I call a deal detective. And so it's about finding ideal acquisition targets. We're looking for certain situations that present themselves as ideal for us. And so the first thing you wanna do is look at who is ideal for your offering. To make this be pennies on the dollar, what I'm talking about and suggesting is, what situation is it possible in where you can instantly triple the current fees that are being charged? Now, that makes a lot of accountants nervous, Michelle. Oh, yeah, everybody. I just did a talk last week and, or Michelle, how do you, how do you raise fees, you know, 300, 400%? Sell me on that idea. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I will. No problem. So, and especially if you've just acquired the firm, there's a lot, it makes a lot of people very nervous because the focus when you first acquire a practice tends to be on keeping those clients. What do I have to do to retain them? But I want to help you see a different goal. I want you to think about a different outcome. If you thought of this business purchase as a way to grow your ideal company, would that be a different outcome? than simply buying a practice and retaining as many clients as possible. Two different outcomes in these scenarios, right? If what we're really trying to do is build the ideal company, we're focused on everything we have to do to make that true. 
And that means we can't worry about the people we do not retain. So what I also want to let you know is it takes a really strong stomach for these types of acquisitions because you're not going to retain 100% of the clients, but guess what? That's not your goal. Your goal, in fact, is to acquire the practice that will end up being pennies on the dollar because you can charge triple the fees. So the first step is to decide what does that client profile look like? Now, in the tax planning world, we focus on businesses. So when I look at sample ads, and I'll tell you just before we came on the air, Michelle, I looked at some open listings just here in California. And when I look at what the listings say, I'm looking at the number of business returns versus the number of individual returns. I'm looking at the number of bookkeeping clients, for example, that's going to be the most important thing to me as a buyer, because I want to make sure that there's alignment in the types of clients that I'm acquiring. And that's building the ideal company versus thinking about, you know, the the current clients and how many you're going to lose. Yes. Retain, I should say. Yes. And can you see where there's a different mindset here, right? Completely. In one situation, we've got a scarcity mindset. What can I do to keep these people from leaving? What tends to happen when I work with practitioners who have this scarcity mindset, they're so focused on preventing people from leaving that they're willing to take less in fees. But that's not our goal here. Our goal is to get more in fees. So, In that mindset, we're actually thinking about this from an abundance mindset, an opportunity mindset. We're looking and saying, look, I acknowledge that this isn't going to be a good fit for everybody in this practice, but I'm also not looking to retain 100% of those clients either. I'm looking for high value clients in this, right? Yeah. And I want to share a story because I have a client who's just like this. We'll call her Susie for today. But she bought practices. There were 552 1040 clients. So if she increased the revenue to what we said, it would have been about a $277,000 annual increase. So about, let's see, it was like maybe, th- you know, two months later, once she figured out what she was left with, she added up all of the paid people who you know, she got money from on the returns versus the ones that she declined or they left. And she gained around $12,000 in profitability and decreased her volume by 50% and still was in the positive with with half the amount of work. So, and her goal was to have about a 50% to 70% retention. So I think in you know, in total at the end, when I get her numbers, it'll be a 70% retention, but still an increase of revenue. So she stayed at the same, you know, 277,000 of revenue plus an extra 12 grand, but decreased the volume by 50%. And this is someone who was absolutely terrified of, you know, seeing the volume go away. Wasn't thinking about, you know, let's focus on what the company looks like and the bookkeeping clients and the valuable type of clientele that we want to keep here. Right. So let's go back to something you mentioned, uh, Michelle, and that was, you know, looking at the number and breakdown of the type of clients. And so one of the things you're going to want to look at is the number of individual returns versus the number of business tax returns and what those average fees are. Now, Low average fees may be an indicator that you've got low income clients, but not always. And so when you're going through this process, one of the things that you're going to want to do is get a sense for what are the average incomes of your clients. And that's something that you can easily obtain by doing database reports, just looking at your tax prep software, running some filtered reports by AGI or by net income for the business, for example. But let's say, for example, my goal is to end up getting this purchase for pennies on the dollar If I'm looking at a listing that has 519 individual clients and 26 business clients, that's not a good practice for me. 
because in fact, I'd just be saddling myself with low revenues uh, to service the uh, individual returns and there wouldn't be a lot of opportunity for planning, right? So you wanna get that client mix down, that's gonna be the most important thing. And while I mentioned a few moments ago, I pulled up some listings, keep in mind, that the best deals are not going to be found through a business broker, but you can actually train and learn by looking at the listings that are there. You want to start to get a feel for what this client mix is, what the average fees are, and how people are pricing those. And that's going to help you become that deal detective. So finding those ideal targets is about networking and building relationships. You can join accounting groups or go to conferences. You can ask existing networking groups that you may belong to, like BNI, for example. You can ask your suppliers or your vendors. So if you have relationships with ADP or Paychex or your um, tax software salesperson or, or um, representative, those can be all great ways to just start to ask around, hey, is there anybody that you know of that's thinking about leaving? And you also want to identify the characteristics of somebody that's close to selling. And, and age can certainly be a factor there, um, but it can also be the number of years in business. It could be changes in the address. You know, a lot of companies downsized and started working from home or remotely. You can see expired accounting practice sales listing. That's usually a good characteristic of someone that was not successful. Um, but that, those are that's how you're going to start to find these opportunities. And while they may not have an official buying package available mm -hmm. or an uh, official sales package rather on their firm, you can just start to ask those questions and to look at database reports. You can certainly sign a non-disclosure agreement so that um, it, they feel comfortable sharing that information uh, with you. And then it's about asking. It's asking everyone, friends, family, people you meet, uh, doing a LinkedIn search, looking at your competitors, um, trade events. Um, you know, these are all potential sources of that ideal acquisition for you. And it's just about putting the word out that you are looking and you're in the market. So it's about identifying those key players. And that's something that you guys could do this week. You could sit down and make a list of key players that you want to talk to and start reaching out. Uh, it's a great way to then make contact and start that dialogue. What's the best? And I, and I think that's all great next steps but I'm curious to know what someone can expect at the end. What's the best deal that you've seen someone, you know, personally how who's bought a tax practice for pennies on the dollars that became the deal detective that you're describing today? Well, honestly, the best deal that I've seen is someone who ended up getting it for zero. <laughs> oh, now, wow. that's a lot of being in the right place at the right time, but you can start to build up that word that you are looking, right? And so that could be as simple as letting people know that you're looking to invest in a business. Now, in fact, I recommend that being sort of your, your introduction to people. Um, it may be awkward if you're just cold calling somebody. So looking for a warm introduction. Do you know somebody who knows somebody? so that they can introduce you. But even just introducing yourself as an investor, hey, I'm looking to invest in CPA firms or I'm looking to invest in tax practices. Um, I wanted to reach out and see if you know of anybody. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're putting that word out, when something happens, like a crisis, for example, you become the go-to person. And so um, this uh, colleague of mine, that's how he picks up practices for nothing. Because a lot of times what will happen is accountants die, unfortunately, um, without having enjoyed retirement. Yeah. And then their family is in a crisis mode. They're in a panic mode. And in fact, a lot of times what happens is the family just shuts down the business. And we know that there's real value there. 
So when you make it known to your community that you're an investor in accounting practices, um, you become that go-to person. So when there is a panic, when there is a crisis situation, you're well positioned to come in and help. And, uh, and especially when you pair that with having an ideal clientele that allows you to come in and offer a high value service, that's how you really maximize uh, the power of leverage, either not coming in with much cash at all, if any, or picking up these firms for next to nothing. Yeah. So what kind of deal structures have you seen that, you know, once you become the deal detective, you let people know? You're now the go-to person when there's a panic or crisis and you're offered this business. What have you seen as the most successful um, deal structures that have closed um, for the firm owner's benefit, for, you know, the, the, uh, the buyer's benefit? Well, I, so I call these zero, zero pocket, zero money out of pocket deals. And so what you want to want to do is analyze the balance sheet. If you can fund a deal from the company's assets, you can come in with nothing down. And so what you're looking are at are you're looking things like uh, for things like accounts receivable, work in process or the WIP account, WIP. You're looking for any liabilities that the person might be able might be looking to get out from under. All of those as part of deal points in acquiring that business can allow you to come in and pick it up for nothing down. So let's say, for example, you're looking at the balance sheet of a tax practice and they've got $50,000 in accounts receivable. They've got about $19,000 in work in process and they have one credit card that that um, is owed $7,000. By assuming all of that, let's talk about what that means. What happens when you assume an accounts receivable? Well, that means you're just waiting for that person to pay you. So instead of the seller being collecting on that, you would step into their shoes and collect. So you're waiting to collect on that, but you're using that money to fund that deal. So if you say, hey, I'm going to let you keep possession of these accounts receivable, if you've got Fifty or hundred thousand dollars sitting in accounts receivable, that now becomes part of how you finance that deal. Work in process. Well, for a buyer, that's really kind of like a liability. The company may have collected retainers or deposits on that, but yet you still have to fulfill on the work that they're engaged for. And so again, saying, hey, Let's just say, for example, you've got $19,000 in work in process and you've offered $100,000 for the firm. Well, now, instead of having to come up with $100,000 in money, you're only now having to come up with $81,000 in money because you subtract out any liabilities that are there. You do the same thing with the credit card. You're going to subtract out and say, hey, I'm going to take that over. I'm going to assume that liability. Again, it's a way to get that cash out of pocket number down so that you don't have to cough up a lot of cash to fund that deal. Mm -hmm. So if you simply add accounts receivable, your work in process, liabilities, then uh, that sort of adds to what you're going to have to come up with. Now, you may not be able to come up with the entire purchase price that way. And so then what you're looking for is a, what we call a seller carry. And so the seller is go, you're going to make payments to that seller over a certain period of time at a certain interest rate. And let's just admit right now, interest rates are on sale. So you, it's possible to have a note that's carried by the seller for as little as 3%. Um, and so you will be making payments over time. But think about that. You're funding those payments with the revenue from the business. Yeah. And if you increase your revenue by 300 percent, then it's really a great deal. Yes. And so that's, <laughs> that's where this idea of earnouts come in, Ms. Michelle. And so you want to be careful with this. Don't pay the seller for your leverage. OK, so when we talk about a seller carry, those are a set amount of payments. It totals a set amount. But oftentimes what will happen is the buyer will come in and say, hey, well, I'll just pay you an earnout, And that's how I'll pay you what I owe you for the business. But if your goal is to come in and triple the revenues, be careful. 
because you don't want to start paying the seller more than um, for your efforts, you know? Yeah, no way. No way. These are these are great, great, great tips. Thank you, Dominique. Is there any other things that you can think of for, you know, those who are really interested in gung-ho becoming a deal detective, learning and figuring out and becoming the go-to person if there's a death or someone, you know, like you said, 70% of firm owners are above the age of 50. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. But for someone who's really trying to buy a tax practice or an accounting firm for pennies on the dollar or free. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, un the unfortunate part of this is that it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of knocking and talking is what we say, right? It's relationship based. So the best deals are going to be found outside of a broker if you're willing to put in the effort to build those relationships you will have something materialized for that, uh, from that rather. And so an action step you might consider is to build your list of specific target candidates. Uh, and so you start doing some reach, research and outreach to your network to say, hey, I'm an investor. I'm looking to invest in a tax practice in the next year. Do you know of anybody? So get talking about it. And when you approach that person, you don't have to be so bold as to say, I want to buy your firm, but you build a relationship. You start get to talking and gosh, hasn't this last two years been so hard? How, how much longer are you planning to learn all these new rules? You know, and, and even just with an indirect approach and saying the same line, I'm looking to invest in a tax practice. Do you know of anybody that might be interested in selling in the next couple of years? You can get some practice and do some research by searching accounting practice sale websites. Again, you're probably not going to find a fantastic deal by going through a broker because the broker wants to maximize the sales price. That's their goal. And they get a commission, you know, so there will be there will be a high, high, high dollar price point because they're not going to work complimentary and they're going to do all your deal paperwork and they won't think of the things like you said with the WIP account, the balance sheet, the liabilities, the AR account. That's all great ways to, you know, have that be part of the, you know, I guess, I don't know if it's the correct word, subtraction from the pur purchase price. I was going to use the word debit, but I didn't do that great in my accounting class. So we'll just say subtraction of the uh, from the purchase price. You're, you're mitigating that cash out of pocket, right? Yep, keeping it as low as possible. And so these brokerage sites can be a good way to get some practice. And so go in and look at the listings, analyze each one for what's good and what's bad, get familiar with the terms and what to look for so that when you do find somebody, you know exactly what you want to look for in their financial records and in their database reports to get a feel for what you're actually buying. Mm -hmm. And from that, you can make a list of lead generators, uh, uh, in terms of uh, people that are connected or that uh, may know somebody that's looking to get out um, in the near future. Uh, we've got lots of members in our community here at um, Certified Tax Planners that this is their growth strategy is that they are regularly and routinely networking with practitioners. In fact, you can purchase a P10 list and contact tax preparers. You focus on the EAs and the CPAs in your area, and you just tell them that you're an investor, you're looking to invest in tax businesses, and it starts the conversation. And it really can be a very fast and effective way um, to grow your tax planning business. And the second key there, Michelle, is that you communicate about what you're doing for someone in a really effective way. Listen, if you've just changed hands in terms of taking over a business, the last thing the customer wants to see is a change. They don't they want to know that things are going to operate the same as usual unless you offer something better. And so if you find those clients that are ideal for tax planning and you can say, hey, I'd like to invite you to come in and sit down and talk about your account. I think there's some moves we can make that are going to save you $40,000 a year in taxes. 
Yeah. Now you can take that person from maybe a $700 tax return to a $7,000 tax planning fee. And that's how you really multiply um, the effectiveness of your purchase. Yeah. Love it. Well, Dominique, thank you so much for sharing all of these amazing strategies and being that, you know, the deal detective and the finder and mitigating how much cash you have to put down on any acquisition and, you know, really thinking about this from a way to grow your firm or even grow your revenue. Because, you know, these are basically leads you're purchasing. So no matter what, you have to pay for marketing or you can pay for your leads this way. So absolutely it mm -hmm. it really can be an effective way and the key though is to not buy something that's going to saddle you with additional work that you're not looking for so finding the right mix of clients and then being okay that you won't retain all of them but that's <laughs> the abundance mindset right yes you have to be okay with them leaving just like Susie was finally okay with having 30 to 50% leap, but she made drastic changes and her revenue is still up with way less volume. So I think that's what really this is about. So thank you again for being here with us today on the Abundant Accountant Podcast. It's always an honor to have you and hope to have you on a future episode. You got it. Thank you all so much for joining Dominique and I here on the Abundant Accountant Podcast. I, I always love anytime we talk about ways and all her tips and tricks for, you know, growing your revenue. And I think buying firms is a great way because no matter what, you're going to pay for your leads. You're either going to pay a marketing company to help you get leads or you're going to get really good at referrals and paying um, people that refer you people. So no matter what, you're coming out of pocket. But if you're really wanting to be a deal detective and um, I loved how she said, you know, you're knocking. I think it was knocking and, and something else. But, you know, you're you're really being about knocking and talking. That's what it was. I knew it rhymed. Knock If knocking and talking is your forte and you love talking to people and you're not one of the more introverted um, tax and accounting pros that I've worked with, then this might be a great way for you to be that go to person if something tragic happens and someone might be selling or there is a death, um, this is your opportunity to really leverage your knocking and talking and becoming a great deal detective and sharing with people that you're open to buying tax practices and really changing it to have it benefit your company and your ideal type client and not just buying it for the sheer volume, but knowing that you're going to shed that volume. So I, I love that. And, you know, if, if knocking and talking is your thing, then this is for sure the way to go. And before you leave, remember, if you're a tax or accounting professional, which if you're still listening to me, I hope you are, and you are sick of grinding 14 hours a day and having horrible tax seasons, sacrificing your time with family and friends, and are just completely exhausted from the daily financial roller coaster, then here's what I have for you. My team and I have set aside time in the next 48 hours to speak to you personally about how you can apply new ideas to your firm, how to start charging premium fees, how to have clients appreciate you for the value you provide and knowing your worth and really start to fire clients who don't, you know, value you and who suck away your time and energy from you. So we can discuss that if you book a call at theabundantcall.com. We're going to cover whatever your biggest challenges are because we've seen them all and we know how to overcome it. On the call, we will get crystal clear on where you're at right now and where you want to go with your firm and the things that are keeping you stuck. We'll identify where you also want to be in your firm to ensure you never give a discount, your paid premiums, and you're paid up front all the time so you can avoid any pitfalls along the way. So once again, head on over to theabundantcall.com and my team and I look forward to talking to you. Have a beautiful day.